It is the early hours of a peaceful morning in August the year 2000. The quiet is punctuated by the calming Picos River near Carlsbad, New Mexico. This morning, a few feet from a service bridge over the river, is a location picked out by some campers. Their night has been uneventful and typical of what you would expect for a summer's sleep under the stars. However, at around 5 o'clock in the morning, the tranquility is blown apart. An explosion would ravage through the campers' bedding and cars. But the explosion is not what from you may think. It's not a camping stove, but from a gas pipeline that bordered the site. Today, we'll be looking at the Carlsbad pipeline explosion. My name is John, and welcome to Plainly Difficult. Background Pipeline explosions have become somewhat of a staple on this channel. Personally, I find them very interesting, as when they fail, they fail big. And it just shows how we are all not so far away from a potentially catastrophic event. The tragedy in today's story is really a terrible case of bad luck and ignorance to your surroundings. But we will come back to this later on in the video. Before that, we need to talk about pipelines but more specifically, the El Paso Natural Gas Company. The company operates over 10,000 miles of pipeline, spreading from California in the west, and Texas and Oklahoma to the east, as well as Colorado to the north. The company was owned by El Paso Corp, who were a natural gas and energy provider founded in 1928. Now, I'm not going to waste your time by digging into the company's history too much, Apart from one of its pipelines, this was number 1103. More specifically, the section of 1103 between two compressor stations, one at Keystone and one at Picos River. This line was constructed in 1950. It was made of 30 inch X52 grade steel with a wall thickness of 0.332 inches. It was manufactured to the then current 1948 standard from the American Petroleum Institute. All good. To protect the line from outside issues such as corrosion, the pipework was given a coal tar wrap. It was connected together with longitudinal welds. The maximum pressure that could be exerted upon the line from the Picos River compressor station was 837 psig, which was below what the pipe was rated for. The line between Picos River and Keystone was subdivided by block valves. In the 1970s, pigging facilities were added to the line. Yes, you heard me right, pigging. Well, not actual pigs, but, but these. They are used for removing unwanted fluid and debris from the pipeline. They are inserted and pushed along the line by the flow of the gas and collected at a receiving area downstream. Removal of unwanted material helps in the fight against internal corrosion without having to stop the gas flow or open up the pipework. But and this is vital for our story, pigging can't be done everywhere on a pipeline. This was between Block Valve 6 and the Picos River Compressor, just outside Carlsbad, New Mexico. And this was due to an installed drip, which had a sharp turn in the pipeline. The idea was that pressure in the line would blow through any debris past the drip into its storage tank, which then it could be recovered. The gas company tried to reduce the risk of corrosion by monitoring gas quality. This would reduce the amount of water in the gas, but it can't be completely excluded, and thus internal corrosion could still be a thing. So, so much that another line in the area experienced a burst in 1997. Sections of pipework under the company's network were inspected and mostly looked acceptable. During this time, no issues arose from line 1103, as the gas quality was good and no water was observed during pigging or at the drip. But we know where this is going, as there was a gap in moisture monitoring records between 1998 and 2000. But before we get into the post-accident corporate shenanigans, we need to get out our bingo cards and look at the disaster. You know how during the video preamble I described a lovely calm and serene campsite? Well, the campers, who would ultimately be the victims, were actually camping right next to a private service bridge which carried two gas pipelines. 
The bridge was rope tied off and multiple signposts were in the area saying, warning, no trespassing. This road and right of way is private property and is not for public use. This pipeline carries natural gas under high pressure and is dangerous. All persons are warned of the danger to person and property. Keep off. This was just right next to the drip and drip tank area. You know, the bit that couldn't be picked. Right, well, it's the morning of the 19th of August 2000 and the three person night crew team in the EPNG control centre are awaiting the end of their 12 hour long shift. The control room in El Paso has two panels, one for the south and one for the north systems. As to the three workers in the control room, one works the north, the other one the south and the other guy oversees the whole shebang. The system for monitoring and managing the pipeline is a long-term friend of the channel and is known as a SCADA system. At 5.26 in the morning, the South Controller received an alarm informing them of a rate of change in the Picos River Compressor Stations Unit 3. Shortly after, Unit 1 also began alarming. This is something that is not good. In net pressures drop, little did the controller know but an explosion had occurred near the Picos River crossing. Let's pause in the control center for a moment at least and wind back to 5.26 in the morning and the 12 people camping by the river. The party was made up of mainly an extended family. Nearby an explosion ripped out of the 30 inch gas pipeline that the camp had been set near. The shockwave blasted through their cars and ripped through the campers, flinging some of the unlucky souls into the river like ragdolls. Meanwhile, back in El Paso, the drop in pressure was followed by a data outage from the Picos River compressor station. The blackout was brief, but this added to the concern. The control room called Picos River District Station to dispatch staff to the compressor station. Roughly around the same time, a member of staff living in the South Carlsbad area called in to his manager, who then called to inform the center that he could see a glow coming from the area near the Picos River crossing. The staff member left his home and made his way to the source of the glow. At 5.44 in the morning, the South controller called the Keystone Compressor Station and requested they shut down all their units in hope to stop the flow of gas. Now the controller was pretty sure that a blowout had happened, but following another data blackout, he wasn't sure which line, as where the explosion occurred there were three lines at the river crossing. A few minutes later, the controller called the El Paso fields and requested they shut down the South Carlsbad compressor station. Back to the Picos River, and within minutes of the explosion, multiple 911 calls came in to report that something very explodey had happened. At around 5.45 in the morning, a pipeline lead operations specialist reached the site and began operating isolating valves. Another staff member arrived shortly after, and they closed block valves on lines 1103 and 1110. During this time, around an 80 foot high tower of flames was bellowing from the ground. They eventually made it to block valve number 6 for line 1103, and after it was closed, the flame tower was reduced. All during this time the campsite was not known about and thus the presence of casualties went unnoticed. One of the two men, after the flames dropped, saw a couple of damaged pickup trucks. This was at 6.21 in the morning. By now more pipeline staff had arrived and the all clear was given to ambulance and fire crews. Although the fire was now out, efforts quickly switched to finding and treating victims. Six of the campers were flung into the river and subsequently dragged out by emergency responders, with the remaining six lying around the ruined campsite. Of the total 12, six were found to be still alive and were helicopter evacuated to hospital, but sadly, all would succumb to their injuries. Gas had to be supplied from storage areas to keep the line in operation whilst the explosion site was investigated and repaired. The explosion and resulting fire created a 51 foot wide by 113 foot long crater. Around 49 feet of pipeline had been ejected into different places. One section being launched over 200 feet away from the crater. These pieces would become valuable in our next section of the video, which leads us on to
the investigation. Being a pipeline disaster in the USA, channel regulars, the NTSB, would be the ones to investigate the cause of the apparently unexpected explosion. Interviews of the crews involved and a thorough inspection of the disaster site would begin to help the pieces of the puzzle come together. The sections of the pipe that had been ejected had shown significant signs of corrosion on the outside. And even worse, one section found concerning amounts of corrosion on the inside with severe pitting, which is definitely not good at all. The sections were sent off for laboratory evaluation. The drip and its tank was also inspected, which found some black oily residue. The NTSB found that the corrosion within the pipe had reduced the wall thickness to a point that it couldn't hold the pressure of gas. It would seem the gas pumped through the pipeline was not properly monitored for corrosion products such as water and contaminants which can cause damage to steel. Apparently in the preceding years before the rupture, EPNG apparently was inspecting all of its pipework for signs of leaks and corrosion. But the NTSB found that the section in question had never been internally inspected and what's more, only two points of the nearby 56 odd mile section have been pressure tested since installation and this explains the lack of records I mentioned earlier. The NTSB would release their report into the disaster which found internal corrosion to be the most likely cause of the pipe's failure. It also blamed the EPNG for not having adequate corrosion detection and monitoring, as well as the particular section of pipes lacking of pigging. They would say in their probable cause section of the NTSB report, the NTSB determines that the probable cause of the 19th of August natural gas pipeline rupture near Carlsbad, New Mexico was a significant reduction in pipe wall thickness due to severe internal corrosion. The severe corrosion had occurred because El Paso Natural Gas Company's corrosion control program failed to prevent, detect or control internal corrosion within the company's pipeline. Contributing to the accident were ineffective federal pre-accident inspections of El Paso Natural Gas Company that did not identify deficiencies in the company's internal corrosion control program. In the aftermath, the pipelines in the area were rebuilt, allowing for full pigging in the future. As noted in the NTSB investigation, on the 23rd of August 2000, El Paso Energy Pipeline Group was issued a corrective action order requiring EPNG to take necessary corrective actions to protect the public and environment from potential hazards associated with its pipeline operation. The company would be sued for loss of life, which would result in multiple hours of court settlements. They were also slapped with a $15 million penalty from the Department of Transport. So it's scale time. I think I'm going to give it a four. And this is what I've got for my bingo card. Do you agree? Let me know in the comments below. This is a Plain Difficult production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Difficult videos are produced by me, John, in a currently wet corner of Southern London, UK. I have a second channel called Made by John, which has music and stuff on. I also have Instagram where I post up pictures of bits and pieces I'm getting up to when I'm not working on videos. And I also have Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it this week. I'd like to have a very nice thank you to my Patreon and YouTube members for your financial support. Your money really helps keep the lights on around here. And also for the rest of you for tuning in every week to watch my dodgy cartoons and listen to me talk. And all that's left to say is thank you very much for watching and Mr. Music, play us out, please.